Um, thank you, Mark. And now I'm going to invite Dariush Barandor to come and give his presentation. Thank you, Michael. Let me start out by thanking the Manchester University for this time to mark the 60th anniversary of the fall of Dr. Mossad Dek, and for, of course, inviting me to, to share my perspective. Mr. Hashtag Mordad, or 19 August, if you will, remains an open one, a watershed that redirected the course of Iran's history, a fault line that divided the Iranian people. For the past 60 years, one narrative has taken hold in the minds of Iranians, just as it has dominated the academic field abroad. This narrative projects the fall of Mossadegh on Misaj de Mordad as the outcome of a coup planned and executed by the Anglo-American intelligence services with the help of their higher Iranian hands. To the extent that this equation, that in this equation, the role and impact of internal political forces, independent of foreign plots, is absent, I consider the narrative as flawed. If you bear with me in the next half an hour or so, I will make a case in support of three broad propositions. Firstly, the overthrow was a consequence, but not a feature of the Anglo-American plot, known as we all know with its code name TPHX. Events that shaped the fall of Mossadegh on Bissahash de Mordad resulted from a clash of opposing internal political forces unleashed by the failure of the TPA Jack School. But there was no organic link between the two events. The overthrow of Mossad there on that day, as a matter of fact, <coughs> took Washington by complete surprise. Secondly, a quixotic surge for full triumph on the oil issue, added to an idealistic domestic agenda, shifted Mossadegh's internal support base from the center to the left of the political spectrum, and ended up changing the American stance from engagement to subversion. Thirdly, the claims of triumph by Roosevelt, largely echoed in the literature, borders prevarication in the most negative sense of the term. I have keyed my presentation to these three broad propositions. I hardly need to introduce internal political forces and their interaction in presence of our stellar panelists and well-informed audience. But for the sake of completeness, allow me a quick flashback. Iran's post-occupation polity had the trappings of a democracy, but was closer to an oligarchy. The Majlis wielded plenty of power without, in real terms, representing the people. The oligarchs were the big landed provincial magnates, remnants of old Qajar elite, and tribal leaders who were always elected no matter who was in power. In parallel, three broad political currents emerged or were revived under the Allied occupation as of the September 1941. Firstly, in that same year, Iran's leftist movement was revived through the formation of the Tudor Party. The party shunned the communist label, but could not long conceal its objective of pulling the country 
into the Soviet sphere of influence. Secondly, as of 1943, the clerical establishment, or the Rohaniyat, reemerged from the harsh secularization drive by Reza Shah and reasserted itself as a socio-political force. The politically activist streak headed by Ayatollah Kashani was in alliance with a small jihadist group known as Fadayan Islam, a by far larger and more influential quiescent segment led from Qom by the Supreme Marja Ayatollah Brujerdi, focused on safeguarding the interests of Shia Islam, fighting heresies of all colors and uh, hues, including atheism of associated uh, with the communist ideology. All three strains in clerical establishment in their own way were involved in politics, even if Brujerdi insisted that clerics should stay out of temporal politics. The third current was the national democratic trend that was to be consolidated in Nehzat al Iran, led by Dr. Mossadegh. It could trace its roots in the constitutional movement, but the takeoff point was the resolution adopted by the 15th Majlis in October of 1947. That resolution tasked the government to open negotiations with Britain with a view to ensuring the country's legitimate rights in the British-run Southern Oil. The Shah and the group of pragmatic techno-politicians around him had a different set of concerns and priorities. Stalin's gaze at the in the northern provinces of Iran was a major preoccupation. So was the issue of poverty and backwardness. The two issues were intertwined, intimately linked, because a country that is poor is an easy prey for foreign domination. The choice of the ruling elite to negotiate rather than confront Britain over the oil revenue was clearly rooted in such preoccupations. The, Shah, the Shah's recipe for poverty was the seven-year development program with a budget of $600 million. It could only be finan financed if Iran's creditworthiness could be enhanced through a boost in oil revenues. This boost was expected from a supplemental oil agreement that the Sa'ed government negotiated with Britain in compliance with the Magnus Resolution I just referred to. This brings me to what I call the fermentation period of the Nefzat Melli. The same old oil accord that for the Shah and his lieutenants was the hope for salvation became the rallying cry of the nationalists in the opposition. J.P. Melli or the National Front and the Mossadegh's leadership was formed in 49, as you know, in the wake of the assassination uh, by the jihadists of the court minister uh, Hajir. By mid-1950, the idea of all nationalization had entered the political lexicon. And an alliance was forged between the political Islam of Ayatollah Kashani and Mossadegh's National Front to reject the supplemental oil accord and promote the nationalization. The Ayatollah also created the bridge between the jihadist faction and the mainly Western-educated liberal Democrats around Mossadegh. It was this tactical alliance that turned the tables against a uh, pragmatist ruling elite. On 7 March 1951, Prime Minister Razmara was gunned down by a jihadist 
producing tectonic faults. In a climate of intimidation, the oligarchs in Majlis reversed their earlier position and voted overwhelmingly to approve Mossadegh's oil nationalization bill. This is how he became prime minister in April 1951. This was also the origin of a new fracture in Iran's policy. The cleavage with its attendant demonization of pragmatist politicians never really dissipated. Now turning to Mossadegh's uh, 27 months rule, and I enter my second uh, broad proposition. This has been covered in the scores of books, including my own, so I don't go over the highlights. If I were, I should want, however, to, to focus on factors that impacted the fallout of Mossad. And if I were to sum up this highly complex set of intertwined factors in two simple propositions, I would say in relation to the oil crisis, Mossadegh lacked an exit strategy. Secondly, while engulfed in a lofty quest to win the oil battle, he opened too many domestic fronts and dangerously narrowed his support base. Let me, let me elaborate on this uh, latter point first his rhetorical constitutionalism with uh, notwithstanding Mossadegh curtailed the 17th Majlis elections, closed down the Senate, and obtained special powers to legislate by decree. He also tried to institutionalize his own highly controversial interpretation of the 1907 Constitution a topic that will be introduced and debated tomorrow. Among the three main political <coughs> currents I just mentioned, it was only the two the party and the left wing of the National Front that in the final leg of Mossadegh's rule gave him all-out support on all issues, notably in relation to his all or nothing oil policy. By early 1953, therefore, his social support base had shifted from center to the left of the political spectrum. As the strains of oilless economy began to trickle down to the ordinary folks, to ordinary folks, Mossadegh's popular support also shrunk. All the above provided a fertile, fertile ground for internal and external conspiracies. Covert action to bring about Mossadegh's downfall was of course not new to Britain. To defeat Mossadegh's nationalization agenda, Britain explored the full gamut of licit and illicit measures too well known to be uh, repeated here. What needs to be highlighted, however, is that as a result of the naval blockade and market manipulations, the nationalized Iranian oil had lost its market by the end of Mossadegh's first year in the office. It was no longer sellable, even with substantial discount. The attitude of Washington, both Truman and Eisenhower administration, and I emphasize that in view of the controversial nature of the point I'm making, both Truman and Eisenhower administration towards Mossadegh was mainly shaped by a quasi-psychosis, which we call the communist paranoia. Needless to say, the non-resolution of the oil crisis fed that paranoia. Mossadegh tapped into these fears and used the two the party as a scarecrow. He needed to maintain the American bailout option by letting Tudor put its street prowess into frequent display. Mossadegh was seeking 
concession from Washington, presenting himself as the only barrier against the communist takeover. But by so doing, he also alarmed traditional clerics. His stratagem worked for some time, but under Eisenhower, it backfired. In the final analysis, it was the failure of his oil policy that turned the Eisenhower administration against him. But for reasons that I just mentioned, that non-resolution of oil would feed <coughs> communism. What's crucial to retain in this connection is that the Eisenhower administration did not, did not enter office with a negative disposition towards Mossad. There was no inherent Republican ideological bias or preset policy, policy line by Dulles brothers, as some scholars have suggested. On the contrary, archival evidence showed that Eisenhower administration entered office with firm intention of helping retain Mossad in office as a rampart against communism. Towards the end of the Truman administration, Washington and London both focused on finding a compromise solution to break the oil logjam. Under advisement from such men in the Foreign Office as Sir Roger Macon and his successor Dixon, London adopted a pedestrian approach to the solution of the oil crisis. The British subversion plan, codenamed, codenamed Boot, was put on hold to give the trilateral oil negotiations a chance. Washington worked hard under both Truman and Eisenhower administrations to resume the flow of Iranian oil back into the market and ensure Mossadegh's solvency. Reasonable, reasonable if hardly ideal, oil proposals had been tabled by London and Washington. They provided, and I say this for the attention of Professor Abraham Yan, they provided for regaining the lost oil market, mainly through cutbacks in Kuwait production, and massive purchase of Iranian nationalized oil by American army and some British firms. Iran had to submit to arbitration by international court at The Hague to determine the amount of the compensation resulting from the nationalization of the Anglo-Iranian oil company. The key issue at that stage was no longer who will have the operational control of the Iranian oil. Once the issue of, nation, of compensation was resolved, Iran's sovereignty over, the, over its nationalized oil could no longer be disputed. In other words, the dossier will be closed. <clears throat> Britain no doubt hoped to obtain compensation for future losses that Dr. Ibrahim Yan, I think, elaborated on very well, hoping to get an exorbitant amount um, to help, in fact, ensure her own solvency. But the courts, the courts, international courts, terms of reference was formulated in a way that, I quote, claims and the counterclaims of both sides had to be taken into account. There was a priori no reason why the court would lapse into breach of good faith and bounds of equity, given in particular the precedent that we all had witnessed a year and a half earlier, when even the British judge voted in favor of Iran in the International Court of Justice. Mossadegh was, however, hunted by the specter of a heavy debt that Iran could incur if the arbitration award recognized 
Britain's claim for future losses. In this mindset, Mossadegh rejected a final oil settlement uh, worked out between London and Eisenhower administration and in a fateful decision on 11 March 1953 ended, ended the trilateral oil talks. The unredeemable, unredeemable strategic error of breaking the oil talks on that day sealed the destiny of the Nehzat and Nelli and with it the course of Iran's history. Now, I don't want to enter into nitty-gritty of preparations of Ajax, um, the, the American coup plot, uh, 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 Professor Gazirovsky just uh, detailed them, and I have uh, the same view as he, as far as the Ajax phase is concerned, with the small differences. Ajax preparatory phase was launched as of late spring, in a climate of acute internal cleavage. The polarization had climaxed in the confrontation at the summit of the state, what we all know as Noah Esfand. Adverse internal forces, including various tendencies within the clerical ranks, began to coalesce. Other than Mossadegh's former allies in the National Front, the purged senior army officers, right-wing and anglophile politicians began to crowd the field, plotting military and parliamentary coups to unseat Mossad. The Shah was not a party to these intrigues, and as late as end of May or early June 1953, urged Henderson to financially support Mossad to allow him time to resolve the oil dispute. For his part, Mossadegh appointed loyal officers uh, to key command posts, including the five brigades in uh, surrounding areas of Tehran. Mossadegh succeeded to unseat Karshani as Majlis Speaker, demanded and obtained collective resignation of majority of deputies, but also earth by organizing a rigged referendum to dissolve the majlis, a measure that rendered him vulnerable to dismissal by the Shah through resort to established constitutional precedents. Now, as far as the military planning is concerned, Professor Kasiriovsky just mentioned George Carroll, who was the man to do that, those preparations. And he also rightly mentioned that, in fact, uh, they, they quickly understood that they were having problem finding enough assets to help them with the coup. But by sheer accident, by sheer accident, they discovered an existing network of mid-ranking line officers in, in the Tehran garrison who on their own were planning action of some kind. CIA clearly notes in its internal history that no bribe was needed for the co-option of Iranian officer, officers in the coup plot. No bribe for the co-option of Iranian officers in the plot. As it is known, Ajax coup plan was launched in the late hours of 15 August. It's also known that through the military network, the two, through its military network, the two party had learned the details of the coup and tipped off Mossadegh who foiled it. The Shah had been blackmailed by the CIA to join the plot, and now in the wake of the coup's failure, choose to flee to Baghdad in panic. As of then, as of this moment, the central political issue in Tehran among Mossadegh's supporters 
was a regime change. Mossadegh himself was reticent and soon became alarmed by the extent of street agitations. The Tudor party, on the other hand, called for creation of a democratic republic. People of the older generation know what the connotation of a democratic republic is. And for establishment of a joint anti-imperialist front and quoting from Dr. Abramian's book uh, in northern provinces, northern towns of Tehran, the red flag even was um, hoisted in some buildings. In an ideological shift, and that's an important point, the party leadership returned to the Stalinist orthodoxy of the proletaria hegemony in the bourgeois phase of the revolution, which meant that from then on the party should be in the vanguard of the anti-imperialist struggle that was then being waged. Up to this point, there is little divergence. There are some divergences, but of lesser importance among historians on the main lines. Differences emerge in respect of the events following the Ajax coup failure. Let me in this last part of my presentation outline in what way my conclusions diverge from conventional narratives that we just heard and to present some evidence in support of my case, primarily from American archives. My first contention is that the Ajax had no follow-up plan, no flop option, no plan B had been foreseen, as conventional narratives have for long led Iranians to believe. In reporting the Ajax coup failure, to Eisenhower on 18 August, the man who directly supervised Iranian affairs, including the Ajax plot in Washington, and the Secretary of State, General Walter Bedell Smith, wrote a note to Eisenhower, telling him in essence that we tried the coup and we failed. Adding then, we now have, we now have to take a new look at the Iranian situation and probably have to snuggle up to Mossadegh. I dare say, he added, I dare say, this means a little added difficulty with the British. Smith had served in previous years as ambassador in Moscow before becoming the CIA director under Truman administration. Now, as Eisenhower's old chum from the Normandy battles, he was the most trusted advisor of the president in the State Department, supervising, as I said, directly the Ajax. This has not prevented some historians, some of our colleagues been present here, to downplay the importance of this evidence or dismiss Smith as a quote uninformed, unquote. Conventional narratives maintain that following the failure of Ajax coup on 16 August, Roosevelt, without informing Washington, even the embassy in Tehran, devised an alternative plan to buy crowds in Tehran and mobilize the Iranian army units from the surrounding garrisons as well as Kerman Shah and Isfahan, we just heard that from Professor Kasyovsky, to bring about the fall of Mossadegh on 19 August. In this Hollywoodian saga, the American hero succeeds to snatch victory out of the defeat in less than 48 hours. This is indeed the account Eisenhower characterized as a dime novel when he finally heard it 
directly from Kermit Roosevelt on 8 October 1953. My third convention, no, contention, sorry. My third contention is that both CIA and MI6 headquarters swallowed that faulty account because both organizations at that time needed success. Rather than admitting to a humbling defeat, they opted for reaping the benefits of success in terms of enhanced standing and prestige in their respective administrations. According to the CIA internal history, following the de defeat of Ajax, General Zaidi refused to throw the towel. In consultation with Roosevelt, a two-pronged strategy was adopted. The first was to put across the message that what had happened on the night of 15 August was not a coup but an orderly change of government, whereby the Shah had appointed Zahedi to replace Mossadegh. The Zahedi camp and the CIA station in Tehran did their utmost to disseminate copies of the Shah's appointment family. But it is the second part of this strategy that is particularly relevant to the topic we are discussing today. Plans had been drawn up and preparations made for a military insurrection from a base far outside Tehran. Emissaries were sent to military commanders in Isfahan and Kermanshah to explore that possibility. Due to its strategic location near the Iraqi border and enough oil refining capacity, Kermanshah was finally selected for the purpose. General Zahedi, according to his son Ardashir, had set out to leave for Kermanshah in the early hours of Wednesday, the 19th August on the very day of the session. But the news of Porsche street demonstrations and the attitude of the security forces on the evening of 18 August made him change his plans. This inherently mid to long term insurrection plan suggests that the Zahedi camp and by the extension the by extension the CIA station in Tehran, were unaware of what was brewing elsewhere in the capital. The Zahedi camp never claimed, unlike what we just heard, the Zahedi camp never claimed credit for the day's event. <coughs> Roosevelt, on the other hand, later claimed, and conventional narratives agreed, that the purpose of Russian emissaries to military commanders in Isfahan and Kerman Shah was to set to get these garrisons to move to Tehran for 28 Mordad coup plan. We just heard this from uh, Professor Gassirovsky as well. Even with, with today's airborne facilities, such logistical feat is hard to visualize. Conventional narratives claim that Crowds were hired by Iranian CIA and MI6 agents. My study maintains that the two principal Iranian CIA agents, Keivani and Jalali, were manipulating a network of small fascist and ultra-nationalist gangs and possibly some mobsters who systematically harassed the two the crowds rather than faking them. The faces of these individuals were known to the security authorities, the activists. And if you read Keanu Reeves' uh, memoirs, he specifically refers to that. The CIA subsidized also a string of papers with virtually no readership. When under the Ajax plan, the Rashid Young brothers embarked on bribing deputies hoping to buy votes for a no-confidence vote against Mossad during Majlis, the harvest was a plain zero, a point 
that was not escaped the sharp eye of the London economist, the reviewer of my book. Not only the CIA internal history does not claim credit for crowd manipulation, but admits puzzlement at pro Shah sentiments in the streets. Describing the CIA reaction to initial pro Shah demonstrations on the eve of Mossadegh's fall. Wilbur writes, and I quote, just what was the main motivating forces is impossible to say, but it is possible to isolate the factors behind disturbances. End of quote. Wilbur then goes on explaining those factors, of which none is linked with foul play of any kind, let alone, let alone CIA manipulation. Not only CIA internal history makes no claim to have bribed the, the clerics, it complains, as Professor Gassiorovsky also referred to, it complains about the lack of cooperation. The internal history would have been written differently had the CIA MI6 agents either directly recruited the crowds or bribed clerics to do so. By CIA's own admission, Following the Ajax coup failure on 15 on August, and the arrest of the coup leaders, and this is an important point I'm making here, the liaison with the main body of this network of officers was severe. In other words, Roosevelt and his team did not know and had no way of accessing the remnants of the network. Okay. I invite scholars who insist otherwise to read page 14 of Append Appendix D of the CIS internal account. To believe that Roosevelt planned a second strike once the first one failed, one must admit that not only he withheld that information from Washington, not only he ignored straightforward instructions received from his headquarters, not only he indulged in unauthorized, lavish spending, but in two cables to Washington, he deliberately misled his hierarchy into believing that A, Mossadegh was there to stay for the time being, and B, Roosevelt himself was gearing up to leave Tehran and needed a contingency plan for exfiltration of 15 unnamed, presumably, fugitives to send them out of Iran. There exist plenty of other very specific archive documents, and I just got the notification that I'm running out of time. So I skip all those things, but I would be glad to leave my notes to whoever would be interested and um, go to the final uh, segment of, of my, my presentation. The evidence that I just presented should not be construed as an endorsement of the claim by the late Shah and the staunch royalists to the effect that Mr. Hashtam Ordaq was a spontaneous popular uprising or beyond the Milli, or in any way a plebiscite for the Shah. From this departure point, I like to wrap up this presentation by submitting my ultimate conclusions. The street pro protests as of early hours of, mo of the morning of 28 Mordad, clearly had the hallmarks of the clerics. To be sure, the ulama had not planned and had not predicted the fall of Mossadegh on that same day. But by deploying their trove out in the streets, they generated a spark that was inflamed. It took fire when 
in the course of the morning security forces. And by security forces, I don't mean military forces. Among the security forces in those days, and I had seen it with my own eyes so many times, there were the police, but they were what they called the martial law forces who were taken from uh, military units. They were wearing the same uh, uniform as, as the military, but they were not combat units. They were simply uh, people who had sort of borrowed in order to maintain internal security in the streets. So it took fire when in the course of the morning security forces refused government orders to clamp down on the crowds and in the course of the afternoon, the, the course of the afternoon, and that is something to be noted, uh, uh, the military units in the nearby barracks intervened. The American embassy, monitoring closely the events, had spotted a total of six, I repeat, six tanks participating in the operations. My study concludes that the top Shia leader, Ayatollah Burjerdi, who already in the previous February, Noah Esfan, had acted to prevent the Shah's departure abroad, again intervened after the Shah left Iran on 16th August. The Shia faith was tied to the Iranian monarchy, just as it was ingrained in the 1907 fundamental law. For the Supreme Marja, the departure of the Shah spelled the republicanism of Turkish variety or still worse communist atheism. His representative in Tehran, Ayatollah Behbahani, a figure widely recognized as having played a pivotal role in mobilizing the crowd, was quintessentially linked to Qom and would not have taken initiative of his own without the consent of Burujirdi at a time when the return of the Shah was at best deemed improbable. There exists no forensic evidence but a body of reliable testimonies from clerical sources, including notably memoirs of Ayatollah Montezeri, who as a young cleric was a Bujerdi aide. Or the three-word pro Shah statement attributed to Bujerdi, which the CIA agents, according to Wilbur's account, had heard about and were trying to reprint in broadsheets and finally, and finally, testimonies of some of the persons, actors, very closely direct, um, involved in the operations, suggest that the street uh, manifestations on that day had the knot of the supreme leader, Ayatollah Burujerdi. I think I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, following the structure I suggested before, I'm now going to ask Mark to respond to some of those points, um, maybe for about five minutes or so, five, ten minutes. And then I will get uh, Dariush to speak again in response. I don't really have a prepared response to this, so I guess I'll make a number of comments that are only going to be loosely linked together. Um, I, I disagree with much of what Mr. Bayendorf said, uh, at least about the coup itself, although not so much with the things he said in the earlier part of his presentation. Let me just address a number of, of the points that he raised. Um, one point he made was that the military plan was based on what he called the sheer accident, that there was already 
an existing military network that was planning some kind of action. Um, it certainly is true that when George Carroll and Abbas Farzanagan came to Tehran to organize a military network, they certainly worked with military officers who were already anti-Mossadegh. There's no doubt about that. Um, and they, you know, from various sources, tried to get information about which colonels were pro-Mossadegh, which ones were anti-Mossadegh. 